I was supposed to talk about post quantum MPC. I thought, you know, let's set a TP MPC workshop. I guess it sounds like a good occasion to talk about my post quantum MPC paper. It's a work I really like. I really like to talk about it. And then it was communicated to me that um, last year, last edition of TPMPC, my co author talked about exactly the same paper. And here's the, <laughs> it was on Zoom, here's a screenshot of the key that delivered in this talk. This is exactly the same paper. Uh, so I decided it would not be a wise idea to give the same talk twice. And so you're going to see a talk about obfuscating quantum circuits. Sorry if you woke up early to see post quantum MPC. Um, but yeah, yeah but, uh, the obfuscating, uh, obfuscating quantum circuit is uh, really, really, uh, I think it's a really fascinating question. And uh, yeah, the, the title of the talk is Can We Obfuscate Quantum Circuit? Let me go back quickly. It's based on a joint work with James Bartosek from ECB2. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with indistinguishability obfuscation, here is the first slide indistinguishability obfuscation. You take a program and you obfuscate it. So this is exactly what. What you think it does, except that uh, defining the security of this object is not immediate at first sight. The intuitive, the intuitive uh, description is that, of course, you want this program to be uh, uh, functionally unchanged in the sense that if you query it on the same input, you get the same output as before, but you want it to be scrambled, namely, you want it to be unintelligible uh, to any uh, uh, external observer who's having the code, who's looking at the code, and try to extract some information about it. And the way to formally define this turns out to be uh, the following security notion. And you know, since it is a card of cryptographer, I'm not going to dwell too much on this. Um, but if you're not familiar with this, maybe maybe just uh, just believe me that this is sort of the right way to define it. Uh, like you could think of stronger ways which are subject to impossibility results. But roughly, the security notion says that for all functional equivalence, functional equivalence circuits or programs. Um, the obfuscations of any two of such programs are computationally indistinguishable. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm going to use programs and circuits pretty much interchangeably during the talk. So I'm just, you know, to, yeah, let's not get too attached to any particular annotation. Um, anyway, so this is the right notion of obfuscation, and there is also ways in which you can show that this is actually the best possible notion of obfuscation. So we're going to, to consider that. Um, uh, and yeah, the importance of obfuscation in cryptography, it's really hard to overstate it because uh, it's sort of everywhere, like it's considered to be like a central hub of cryptography. Um, and um, you can essentially take any your favorite cryptographic primitive and do it from obfuscation. And even more, uh, you can, you know, even expand sometimes the scope of what we know in cryptography and, and, and construct new primitives that we did not know how to construct before using obfuscation, such as functional encryption and multi party non interactive key exchange. Here's like public key quantum money, is a new one. But uh, yeah, uh, this is uh, what obfuscation is useful for, and among other things, it's also useful for MPC, for example. Non interactive MPC is it, in fact equivalent to obfuscation. Um, so this here is the connection with, with MPC. Um, right, so in terms of construction, what do we know about indistinguishability obfuscation? Well, recent works established that indistinguishability obfuscation, I will be short, uh, exists from a set of well founded assumptions. And, and I'm not going to describe exactly what these assumptions are, but they are well studied assumptions. We have confidence in them. Um, and except for this talk, we care about you know, quantum versus uh, quantum, which of course also post quantum uh, security. And so those assumptions are, are not going to be good for us because they are uh, based on the well, discrete logarithm like problems. And of course, in particular, they are broken by, by Schor's algorithm. So um, then the question, of course, is do we know any, uh, uh, any candidate for, for, for post quantum distinguishability obfuscation? There are a few. There are a few. Um, they are not based on like such nice assumption, but uh, you know, there, is, is, there is quite a lot of work in the area, and we are confident that. Uh, uh, soon we'll find like a good candidate also. I mean, those are already good candidates, but like, uh, um, yeah, we will we'll, we'll hope to find like something that is like very, very, very well studied in standard assumptions. Uh, so lots of progress in the area. Candidates which are not broken to the best of my knowledge. No, no there's no attack to the best of my knowledge against the construction. Um, so this is classical indistinguishability obfuscation. Uh, enter quantum obfuscation. Here it is. 
uh, quantum obfuscation. Now you have a quantum program, you want to obfuscate it. And you might look at the definition and it looks surprisingly similar to the classical definition because it's exactly the same definition. So it's trying to program to hide the implementation while maintaining functionality. Um, and the security is defined precisely as the classical, uh, as the classical uh, counterpart or any two functional regular circuits that obfuscations and computation are indistinguishable. Um, I should mention that, uh, that, of course, this is going to be a talk about quantum crypto, but there's not, not much knowledge to quantum uh, needed for, for in terms of quantum quantum background. So if you're if you're not familiar, I, I think you should still be able to follow. But please, if I say something that that uh, uh, that, that, that strikes your nerve, just ask a question, interrupt me at any time. Um, good. So here is the definition. What do we know in terms of quantum obfuscation? Well. This is not a problem that I, that I came up with. This is a problem that people ask for. This is a question that people ask before. And in fact, the best of my knowledge, the first, uh, the first mention of quantum obfuscation was from the work of Alagic and Pepperman, where they provided the definition of framework for quantum obfuscation. And among other things, they showed, or like they more, more like mentioned, that quantum obfuscation implies witness encryption for QMA. I'll come back to this later. Uh, but for those of you who don't know what QMA is, you should just think of it as just a quantum version of MP. So it's, it's quite natural. Classical AO implies with this encryption for MP, quantum IO implies with this encryption for QME. This is not, yep, yeah, it's, it's a quite natural. And this is the construction is exactly the same. Um, good. So we have an application. So this means like something potentially useful that we care about. Um, and I would argue that, you know, like we have like sort of this, this central hub of cryptography, which is classical obfuscation. Can we get like a central lab of quantum cryptography, quantum obfuscation? We don't know. Uh, unfortunately, in terms of construction, the situation is much, much less clear. There are, uh, prior to our work, there were exactly two constructions of quantum obfuscation. Um, there is a perfect obfuscation, namely without assumption, for a very limited class of quantum circuits. And there is a construction that uses, uh, that uses uh, a post-quantum post -quantum classical obfuscation it is able to obfuscate uh, 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 this the following class of quantum circuits. So, namely, the, all the circuits that uh, contain gates from the from the Clifford group, and logarithmically many T gates, which are like uh, uh, coupling gates. So, if you don't know what that means, it's fine. It doesn't matter. So, but let me comment a bit on these classes. Um, so, first of all, the the the, the first. The first construction, we know it cannot work for all circuits, or at least we believe it cannot work for all circuits because it's an unconditional construction. And we know that that obfuscation, even classical obfuscation, uh, cannot unconditionally exist unless P equals, if it equals P, because it would imply that P equals P. It just implies that you sort of can find efficiently a canonical representation of a circuit, which we believe is not possible. Um, so my claim is that, that there is very little hope to extend the first construction to all circuits. Um, uh, what about the second construction? Well, uh, uh, you have to think that, uh, 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 that the quantum circuits that consist only of gates from the Clifford group are classically simulatable. So obviously the, the manipulation of quantum state is not classically simulatable. That's by definition a, a non-classical uh, uh, capability, but the computation that you get out of the circuit uh, exactly for this class of family is exactly the kind of computation that we know to classically simulate. Um, and uh, so, so the, the, the situation is, is pretty unsatisfactory. And, and by this, I, I don't mean to, to suggest that these are trivial work. Actually, these are, are pretty interesting work. It's just, it, it's hard to make progress. Um, it, it's a hard problem. So we don't know how to, yeah, we didn't know better than this up until yeah, here last year. Okay, so that's it. And of course, none of this, uh, none of this scheme implies any sort of witness encryption for QMA. So we're in the situation where we have a few candidates, we have an application, but we don't have a candidate that actually can, we can use to construct that application. Good. So what about our work? Well, uh, we have two kinds of results. So the first result is a construction. And let me list the assumptions. We have a lot of them. Uh, so the first assumption is the quantum, the quantum hardness of learning with error problem. This is the least problematic assumption. I'm very happy if this was the only assumption uh, uh, that we had. Of course, you know, maybe some of you may argue that this is inherent, maybe not, but uh, we are very happy with this assumption. 
I don't need to explain that this is a standard assumption in cryptography. Um, the other assumption is that we assume post quantum IO for classical circuits. And I would argue that this assumption is, is, is necessary because, of course, if we, are, if we are obfuscating quantum circuit, you know, we better also obfuscate classical circuits as well, right? I mean, this, this is like a potentially more powerful class. So, BQP is potentially more powerful than P. So, of course, uh, under the hood, we would have to use some sort of classical obfuscation. So, I would be also very happy if this was the only assumption. Um, this is the uh, uh, bit, bit, a bit less happy with this assumption, but you know, it is started. So, this is a dual mode classical verification of quantum computation, CVQ, CVQC for short. And uh, I'm going to come back about, uh, about this. We're going to describe in detail what this building block is. But we assume that this thing exists. Um, but we're only able to show that this thing exists in the, in the, in the quantum random oracle model, and which doesn't really, doesn't really uh, play around well with, uh, with obfuscation. Uh, but uh, you know, it's a start. Um, well, OK, so these are our assumptions. Uh, assuming these assumptions, we show that there exists an obfuscator that takes a simple quantum circuit, and alpha is an obfuscated version of it. And the correctness is, is what you would expect, that uh, uh, the obfuscation has roughly the same functionality as Q. Roughly here is because uh, quantum circuits are inherently randomized, and so there is a bit of sometimes there's a bit of a, uh, an error, and the bug, bug book, you know, there's a way to account for that. Um, and the security is exactly what you would expect. So for all pairs of functional equivalent circuits, uh, it holds that their obfuscations are computationally distinguishable. Now here there is a big big caveat is that we only consider in particular we only give security for what we call null circuits. What are null circuits? Null circuits are circuits that output zero on all inputs. Or well, to be more precise, these are circuits that output zero on all inputs with overwhelming probability. That's something you always have to specify with quantum circuit. Again, they are inherently randomized. Um, if that doesn't sound too useful to you, you you you, you I could understand this. And maybe maybe. The, the, the question that you're wondering now is why isn't the zero symbol a good obfuscation for an alt circuit? But it's not. And the reason is that uh, uh, we only want security for an alt circuit, but we want correctness for all circuits. So th that's important. And it makes the problem non trivial. Um, well, to substantiate the usefulness of this class, uh, oh, sorry, this, this slide after. So if you're not happy with these two assumptions, um, you can think of it as just a result that allows us to bootstrap classical virtual black, black box obfuscation from uh, 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 quantum null black box, uh, quantum null black box obfuscation. Now, uh, of course, quantum, we know that quantum, uh, that in general, classical VV is impossible, even with quantum com computation. This has been recently shown uh, uh, by these two by these two results, AP20 and ABDS20. Um, and uh, right, but uh, of course, you, you know, the argument here is that yes, it's in general insecure, but it doesn't mean that it's insecure for all circuits. So, you know, at least we have a candidate that can be heuristically instantiated with, with post quantum, with post quantum in this invisibility obfuscation. And uh, if you think about it, this is not much different from what people do uh, with random oracle. Uh, we know the random oracle is impossible, it, does, it, cannot, it cannot be instantiated securely, but we still hope that. You know, uh, for some reasonable instantiation of the hash function, uh, the, the, the construction remains secure. It's not very different from what we're doing here. Of course, what we're doing here is significantly stronger, uh, but uh, you know, it, it is what it is. Um, if anybody has anything, good. Um, good. So here are the results. And uh, well, it doesn't, as I said, like quantum null circuits don't, don't sound particularly useful, but I make the case that they are. Um, and the, the second result is that we provide a bunch of applications that follow from quantum null IO. So, first of all, we show that quantum null IO does imply within syncretion for QMA, which was indeed uh, what, this, uh, what, what this work from Alaska and Pfefferman asked in the first place like, can we do with encryption for QMA? Um, and you know, under this assumption, we give a, a positive answer to the question. Um, and not only that, but with this encryption for QMA, sometimes in conjunction with classical IO, obviously with post quantum security, it gives birth to a bunch of new cryptographic primitives uh, that we didn't know how to do before. So, here is a list, is a non exhaustive list uh, uh, of primitives that the only way we know how to do them is with this approach. So, 
uh, NISIC or QMA, we know we know designated verifier for, from different assumptions, but like if you want public public verifiability, so the way we know NISIC for MP, this is the only approach we know how to, how to construct it. And to be fair, I really believe that this list is not exhausting. At some point, the paper just became too long and we stopped finding application. We said, okay, this, this is enough, but I'm sure there will there are other applications. Um, good. Um, so, uh, so throughout the rest of this talk, the, 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 the outline is going to be that I'm going to start from the reverse. So first I'm going to show this implication. I'm going to show that quantum null IO implies witness encryption for QMA. And then I'm going to show that witness encryption for QMA implies non-interactive zero knowledge for QMA. Um, and I'm going to define this pretty good. So if you've never seen them, don't, you shouldn't worry. Um, and afterwards, I'm going to spend a few words on how to actually construct uh, quantum null IO. Okay. So witness encryption for QMA. Uh, witness encryption for QMA starts from a language L in QMA, and uh, the intuition is that you want to encrypt with respect to an instance of this language. So in particular, you have two, two, two algorithms, uh, an encryption and a decryption algorithm. An encryption algorithm takes this input a message and a statement X, and it outputs a cipher text. And the correctness is that uh, uh, we can use any witness size. This funny, this funny can symbol this means the size of one state um, to, uh, 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 to decrypt this message. Um, if you're familiar with witness encryption for MP, MP is literally the same thing, except we're substituting you know, quantum nets where, wherever we need it. Uh, so this is the correctness. And for security, again, identically for witness encryption for MP, we just say that if X is not in the language, so if X is a false statement, then the message M is hidden to the eyes of any efficient adversary. So message M is it. okay. And uh, well, now that uh, you know, assuming that we have quantum null IO, there is a very simple way to, to construct this. Um, what's the construction? So let me just describe the encryption algorithm. So the encryption algorithm defines the circuit Q um, that takes its input. Uh, quantum state psi checks if psi is a valid witness for the given statement x, and if that's the case, it just outputs m, and otherwise outputs zero. Okay, and the uh, encryption algorithm is literally the obfuscation of the circuit with the message m and the statement x are required. Okay. Um, right now, correctness of course follows by the correctness of the obfuscation because it preserves the uh, the, the functionality of the program, in particular, this means that whenever, whenever we are inputting a valid witness psi for for the given statement, then the 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 the, the, the office the circuit returns the message. Uh, and the security of NALIO immediately implies the security of a witness encryption. Why? Well, uh, if 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 you consider what happens when uh, a statement X is not in the language, this means that there exists no quantum state psi that uh, allows us to uh, 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 verify the witness relation of, of x right so in particular there exists no input no quantum state that input to this circuit um it gives us an accepting statement so we can call the security of null circuits so this is why now null obfuscation is useful okay can you and, say again what QMA is? oh yeah, yeah qma is so is the quantum analog of mp and formally the description of qma is that uh, uh, so is the, the an instance of QMA is defined by a classical description of a quantum circuit, um, and uh, 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 so a, a statement is said to be in QMA if there exists a quantum state that on input this quantum circuit, the, the, the circuit returns one with more than probability x, whereas it's not if if it's less than prob probability y, and there should be a gap between this x and y. You can think of, of x being one and y being zero. It's not like this, but it's more of this. Yeah. Big difference that the witness is quantum. Is Sorry. Is it any big difference that the witness is a quantum state? Um, well, it's just more general. Uh, we could you, you can consider also QMA with classical witness. I think that's called QCMA. It's a different class, though. I don't think we know. Uh, I mean, obviously, one implies the other, but I don't think we know any, we know anything uh, in the other direction. Um, I, I don't think I. I'm pretty sure we don't know how to simulate. QMA with QC. Um, uh, yeah, so I might be wrong. Uh, let me, let, maybe we can, I can double check this offline, but 
So this is the of the output is done inside the, so the language. Excuse me. The, the, the output of the language is not a custom state. It's, 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 a, it's a classical. It's a zero one. It's a zero one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it, it's a, yeah, yeah, it's a decisional problem. But yeah. Yes, yes, thank you. So, yeah, by the way, um, yeah, thanks for pointing this out. Actually, maybe I should have said it, uh, at the beginning. Um, we always consider in this work a, a, a quantum circuit with zero one inputs. So, well, in particular, you know, this, uh, oh, sorry, with classical inputs. Um, in particular, for example, this is a, this is a circuit with a classical, sorry, the classical output. Sorry. This is a circuit with a classical output because it, it, it either outputs both or, or, um, or, or M. Right, those, those are classical string. Classical non quantum. In case. Uh, so when I say classical, I mean non quantum, the, the, the stuff we, we write on our computer. Okay. Yeah, thanks a lot for the questions. If more, please. Okay. Good. So, um, so here it is construction of, of, of witness integration for QMA. Now, what can we do with it? Well, let's do music for QMA. Uh, and easy for QMA is exactly what you think it is, is a non interactive proof of the validity of a certain statement in QMA. Uh, again, we start with the language in QMA, and uh, as all NISICs, it must be in this DRS model, common reference string. The prover takes its input uh, quantum, a quantum witness, a statement X, and outputs a proof pi. Um, here, I pi as a classical string because for us it's going to be classical, but this notion is non trivial even if pi was a quantum state. Okay, so, but. For simplicity here, just refer to it as a classical string. And the verification output is zero one, so it wants to be convinced or not. And you know, the, the properties of NISIC for QMA are defined exactly as the NISIC for MP. So if you have a valid witness, you should be able to compute a valid proof. Uh, the proof itself should not reveal anything uh, uh, about, the, about the witness beyond the fact that it exists. And soundness is it says that if the statement is not in the language, then no efficient adversary can generate a valid proof. It's pretty, pretty standard. So let me show you how to use with the situation for QMA and classical IO in order to construct NISIS for QMA. Again, the only way we know how to construct public, publicly verifiable NISIS for QMA so far. No other way that I'm aware of. If you have one, please let me know. I'd be very curious. Um, so the, 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 the only thing that we have to be a little careful when we define is just the common reference string. And the common reference string, uh, we define it to be so we define this program to be a classical circuit that takes its input an x um, and returns a witness encryption of a signature sigma on x okay and the witness encryption is under x so it basically uh, 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 encrypts a signature under its own statement this is a completely classical circuit because our witness encryption has a completely classical algorithm um, and uh, therefore we can obfuscate this circuit Using <clears throat> classical distinguishability description, and that's literally what the CRS is. Um, in order to prove what are we going to do, we're going to query the obfuscated program on the statement X, and then use the, our witness side to decrypt the witness encryption. So, what does this give us? Well, this will give us a valid signature sigma on X. Yes. Why, why so, so, I mean, X comes from, from the original X that was pure, that was pure, right? Yes. Okay. So, so, how do you manage to? Classical oh, good, good. So, the QMA is a set of classically described circuits. So, the description of a quantum circuit can be done classically, right? And write on a board. So, that's literally what X is just the classical description of a quantum circuit. Is well, everything that, that is quantum is in the statement. That's, that's, how, that's how QMA is defined. Uh, I can index QMA, QMA instances by just you know, like finding a canonical representation, just, you know, it's something I can write on a board, therefore it's something I can obviously classically. Um, I mean, of course, the witness must be quantum, of course, but, uh, uh, and then, right. So obviously running the circuit will be a quantum operation, but just describing the circuit, it's not, it's a classical operation. Um, and that's what we use here. Um, good, so, uh, um, right, um, so the witness, the witness sign allows us to recover the signature X. Signature is a classical signature. As we, as we just argue, X is a uh, classical description of a quantum circuit. So I can just verify the signature. So, and this is a valid proof. The reveal is nothing about the validity of the statement. And well, it's not hard to, uh, to see that if X is not in the language, then it will, such a witness will not exist and the statement and the, and the signature will be uh, hard to recover. So the particular will be hidden by the witness encryption. 
um, an important and not, well, a nice feature of this algorithm is that both the verification and the common reference string are completely classical. Of course, someone has to do the quantum computation, which is happening only on the prover side, which is you know needed because the prover is actually holding a quantum state as a witness. So it better be quantum that, that operation. Okay. More questions. Moving. So I've been okay. I've been a little bit unwavy about the security of this thing. Typically, I don't know for, for those of you who work on I/O, they know that, that typically you cannot just put signatures there. You have to do a, like a little bit of puncturing take. But that that that's all standard things. We, we can we can make it work. So, but this is this is this is the intuition of what's going on. So the construction. So, yeah. so intuitively, there are other construction like the, the music using the obfuscation where. The common reference where you input the, the witness directly to witness to the to the common reference string and then you get out of signature. Yeah. So you have this access set of the witness encryption. And yeah. usually the reason you can't run the, the witness directly in the common reference string is that the office, that's an office, the cousin obfuscation. Why, why can't you do oh we're trying to why can't you put the, the quantum obfuscation in CRS? I guess that's the question. Oh, you could, you could. Okay. Uh, it's just like we it's just witness encryption for QMA is just like a a weaker primitive, so we thought it would be like uh -huh. a, a weaker set. But yeah, in principle, you could use the quantum LIO and just put that into the CRS. Yes. Okay. And it's going to be a classical string still, so it would be exactly the same. Okay. Yeah, okay. very good point. Um, more questions. Um, good. So um, now I'm going to uh, describe how to construct quantum, quantum null IO, so quantum IO for, for null circuits. I understand what I Uh, you 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 have you have uh, 15 minutes. Good, I have 150 slides. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, I'm perfectly on time. Fantastic. Uh, okay, so what, <clears throat> we have no idea how to obfuscate quantum circuits. So uh, uh, so our dream as a my 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 well my dream as a classical human with, with a classical mind is to sort of bootstrap um, uh, what we know classically. We, we, there's a lot of work on I/O, of course. We know how to obfuscate I.O. reasonably well by now. So can we bootstrap the obfuscation of classical I.O. to quantum circuit? What do I mean by that? So ideally, what, what, what I would like to happen is that uh, uh, the only circuit that I, have, that I have to obfuscate here is a classical circuit, and all the quantumness, all the, all the quantum quantum uh, computation is happening in some in some external point of the scheme, and then these two these two things hopefully they have to uh, uh, they have to communicate a bit. And uh, you know, if you have a quantum computer, you could extract the output of the circuit this way. I mean, of course, this is too simple, um, and 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 I will never work exactly like this. But this is sort of the intuition. This is sort of the the, the guiding principle, I think, of many many works on on, on quantum crypto. Um, and uh, so for this, we are going to use the fact that. Obviously, we cannot hope to simulate all quantum computations classically, but what we can hope, and in fact, we do know how to do, is to verify that the computation, the quantum computation was done correctly in a completely classical protocol. This is a very recent development. We didn't know how to do this uh, up until like a few years ago, but it was like a, a series of breakthrough results that, that essentially show, well, the, the, the culmination of that is a two round uh, protocol, uh, classical verification of quantum computation, CVQC for short. That allows a verifier, a classical verifier, to interact with a quantum prover and verify that any quantum computation was performed correctly. And um, slightly more formally, the verifier will, will sample this first message, um, and the prover will return a given proof uh, pi for, for a quantum circuit Q and a statement X. Uh, and the verifier will just output Y, which is going to be the output of uh, the quantum circuit Q on X. Okay. Uh, and note that the only quantumness that is happening is happening here inside of the head of the prover. Everything else, literally everything else, the verifier, the communication, everything is classical. Um, of course, for this to be specified correctly by the verifier, our input now needs to be classical. So classical input, classical output, quantum search. Okay. Um, so this is our tool. And uh, what do we want from this tool? But the only property that we want is that uh, an efficient prover cannot force the verifier to output an, uh, an, to output some y, which is not the output of the quantum circuit. Okay, so that's that's the only property that we want. 
But uh, this, so, you know, like uh, maybe our hope is to sort of obfuscate this circuit here and then hope that, you know, like that, that, that this guy that is played here is not, uh, is not be able, is not able to extract too many information from this, from this interaction. But uh, the problem is that we have no guarantee on, on the hiding of this message, in particular this message to just, you know, just describe the circuit Q in plane. So, uh, uh, but, so in particular, it doesn't have what we call blindness. So in particular, it means that the blindness says that the prover cannot learn anything about the circuit Q. Uh, this doesn't have it. But fortunately, there's a very natural solution. You know, we are in theory land, so we don't really care about great efficiency. Just just add the QFHE to it. Or QFHE is what you would expect it to be. It's just an FHE where you can run quantum circuits on it. Um, and crucially, there are, there are constructions that satisfy this notion. And the uh, 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 encryption of a classical message is a classical string. So this is good because the verifier has to first start with an encryption of a, a, of a classical string. So it, it, to keep the verifier classical, everything needs to be classical there. So we can do that. And uh, now I note that this adds uh, the, uh, a secret key to the verifier because it, it, before, before, before outputting the, 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 the output of the computation, it needs to verify that the computation was done correctly. Okay. Um, we know how to do all this stuff from LWE. So there's a series of work starting from the, the result of Mohammed that showed how to do this, all this building block from LWE. And so our approach would be literally to obfuscate this part of the circuit, so namely the last message of the verifier, which takes us into the proof and returns Y. And the first message of the obfuscated, uh, sorry, the CPQC, except encrypted under, under QFH. So now, throughout the rest of this talk, I'm going to swipe the detail a bit under the rug. So I'm just going to refer to this thing as the public parameter. And we can, we can just think of it as just the verifier of the uh, second message of the verifier of the CPQC. Again, it's classical, I think it's classical obfuscation. This is going to be my obfuscated circuit. So it's just these two components. Um, and well, to evaluate the circuit, you can just uh, run this message of the verifier and the FHE and you know, feed it into the circuit and see where it outputs. So this is literally construction. Um, uh, unfortunately, it's not so easy to prove security. And for those of you who have worked with IO, the big challenge is that, uh, uh, recall that we want to prove security for all non circuits. We want to go uh, uh, to, to argue that this obfuscation is computationally distinguishable from the obfuscation of the circuit that always outputs zero. So this is always a challenge with obfuscation. Now the problem is that if you if you remember the definition of obfuscation, what it says is that we can only apply this this computational indistinguishability for circuits which are identical, literally identical. So we cannot, and, and these circuits are, are clearly not identical. And the reason is that the CPC protocol is only computationally sound. What this means is that um, valid proof for false statements always exists. It's just they are hard to find, uh, but, but they exist. So this means in particular, sometimes this circuit will accept. Okay. Um, so here's that's the main challenge. How we solve it? Well, we, we have to devise the dual mode CPC. So I'm going to quickly define dual mode CPC um, and then show a construction of dual mode CPQC, and that's going to be the end of the talk. And you're, you're, you're going to be released <laughs> through non quantum things. If you like to do quantum things. Okay, sorry. Good. So, dual mode CPQC. So, here is the, here is the CPQC protocol. And I'm just going to think about it as a, a sort of a, 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 a non interactive circuit that takes this input uh, quantum circuit and outputs some public parameter and some secret string that will need to will need to, to be used later in order to, to run the second message of the verifier. So I just want to think about this, this generation algorithm like this. I will have a dual mode, which is computationally indistinguishable from the normal mode, which has a trap door. You can think of it as just like another verification key. Um, and this trapdoor defines a dual verification algorithm, uh, which is functionally equivalent to the normal verification algorithm. So verifying the circuit using this secret key is actually identical to verifying this circuit using this trapdoor. So I'm going to switch to, uh, uh, this allows me to switch to uh, a dual verification mode, but uh, you know, this is literally equivalent. Um, and then I'm going to have a third mode, which I'm going to call simulation mode. And such a simulation mode, uh, uh, it, it doesn't have a secret key anymore, and note that it doesn't take this input any circuit. Um, instead, it just outputs the public parameter and the trapdoor. And again, it defines. In that case, we have the property that 
the dual verification mode uh, uh, called on, on the tractor, on the simulated tractor, um, on the simulated tractor um, is, 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 is functionally identical to the mouse circuit, okay? Uh, so we did a bit of a detour, but uh, hopefully you see where we are going. And well, we, the point is that now that we have these properties, we can sort of do the steps of the uh, of the probe uh, step by step. But at, at each step, we can argue about computational indistinguishability. So we can start from the original obfuscated circuit, do a few steps, and then go we'll, uh, arrive at this pod circuit. And you can check that. Well, I'm not going to do it online, but you can check that. Um, um, every time I'm uh, arguing computational indistinguishability, I'm either appealing to such property, or whenever I'm appealing to uh, uh, to the to the I/O indistinguishability, I'm always doing that with two circuits which are functionally equivalent. So these properties are actually sufficient in order to argue indistinguishability. Okay, this is the kind of tricks you always have to do when when working with I/O. Um, good. So what about dual mode CPC? Does it exist? Well, unfortunately, we don't know any construction in the standard model. Um, and this is also true for non-dual mode CVQC. We don't know any two-round CVQC uh, in the plane model. Uh, but we do know a construction. We give a construction in the quantum random oracle model. Um, and the construction is very simple. It's just the same as the old CVQC, um, except that in addition to the proof pi, one includes the uh, 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 the hashing of the group pi, where the hash uh, where the hash function is just modeled as a random oracle. And in addition to checking the validity of pi, the verification also checks again if the um, if the hash was correctly computed. So this is literally it. Um, and uh, now I'm going to quickly show um, uh, uh, why this is a dual mode CVQC. And the proof, of course, will be in the in the quantum random oracle model. Uh, I'm going to be a, a little bit sloppy about details, so I'm not going to, to really uh, talk about uh, superposition queries, but maybe you can trust me or read the paper that, that this thing can handle can handle be, uh, can, can be handled rather easily. Um, so for, for those of you who are not familiar with this with this literature, the, the, the random markers is implements the following mapping. And it just it just it just uh, goes from x to y to x uh, y x or uh, uh, h of x, where h of x is a uniform sample function. The reason why we do it this way is that because uh, quantum computation needs to be invertible, but uh, you, you can think of it as just the standard random oracle if you don't, don't like quantum computation. Um, so in normal mode, the the, the, the random oracle doesn't do doesn't do anything special. Um, uh, again, this is not the way we, we actually define it in the paper, but you know, I think it's useful to think about it like this. So the first, the first, the, in the normal mode, the random oracle simply assigns a random string r to a given input x. And uh, whenever you query the random oracle on X, it returns R. Again, for those of you who are, who are curious about superposition query, you can just implement the same mapping if you're query, querying it on, a, on, a, on an arbitrary state. Okay. So this is the normal mode. Nothing is happening. Um, in dual mode, the thing that we do is that we are going to uh, sample the string R with one bit less than we had before. So namely, we're going to chop off a bit from R. Um, then we're going to parse X to be a candidate proof. So we're going to pretend that X was a proof for a CVQC protocol, for a CVQC protocol, and we're going to verify and check whether it does verify or not. This is a bit that determines whether the proof verifies or not. I mean, of course, you can query it on, on anything, but it was just going to pretend it's going to be a proof. Um, and then we're going to uh, append this bit B uh, to the output of the random oracle. I mean, of course, we cannot just do it like that because it, it, would not be, it would not look random. So what we have to do, we just have to mask it with uh, a, a quantum PRF. Uh, quantum is just because we need quantum security. Just think of it as a PRF. Uh, with a PRF that outputs one bit, and our tractor is going to be the key of the PRF. So this is going to be just the, the, the masking factor that uh, is going to uh, 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 make the query of, uh, sorry, the, the, the answer of the random work for looking random. Um, and the intuition here is that if we have the tractor, we don't need to rerun the verification of the CVQC. We can just compute this mask and shave it off the last bit of the output and recover B, which already tells us whether it was a good proof or not. But this is sort of a way to have like another uh, uh, verification mechanism. 
in, 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 in our CBTC. So now you can think of it as with the verification happening in the random Oracle instead of the in the in the opposite circuit. Okay. And now simulation mode, what do we do? Well, we just uh, we just set B to be always zero. That, that's how we do. And now it's not, you know, now it's pretty easy to see that. Uh, uh, if we were to use the trap door to uh, verify uh, this, the, 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 the validity of the proof, we always, we always return a check. So it's always zero. It's always zero. And we can show that these three modes are actually, are actually computationally distinguishable if the CDPC is sound. Let's stare let's at the slide for a couple more seconds. Good. I'm done. Um, open questions. So great news, there are a lot of open questions and uh, you don't need to be a quantum information theorist to work on it. I think, you know, it's sort of a, like a very accessible uh, area. I think we try to also make a bit of an effort to make to, to make the paper uh, accessible to a, to a classical audience uh, like myself. And um, but there are really a lot of open questions that I encourage everybody to think about. Um, first of all, there is that I'm aware of no candidate construction of obfuscation for all circuits. So recall that we just obfuscated null circuits. I have no idea how to obfuscate uh, all circuits, so not null circuits. If you try to, I mean, syntactically, you could use our construction to obfuscate non-null circuits, but it turns out that for non-null circuit, there is actually an attack. Uh, so it's, it's just plain broken. So. You know, like I'm not even talking about proof of security. I don't even know heuristic instantiation. So give me an, instanti an instantiation that I cannot break in, in five minutes. So I don't know how to do it. It would be interesting to see it at least. Um, of course, now you can ask the question of whether any of the applications that we obtain from Monalio can be constructed without Monalio. So this is sort of uh, maybe it's the, I believe, successful story of. Uh, uh, the last decade of people sort of trying to circumvent IO um, to construct all the application of IO. And we have like really a lot of cases where this has succeeded. For example, I don't know, from, from the top of my head to run to run MVC, we started from IO and, and ended up from OT, uh, correlation intractable hash, we started from IO, ended up with LWE and even even DDH. No, yeah, so, so exponential DDH. So anyway, like lot of uh, lot of success story and you know can we replicate it in the quantum settings I think it's an interesting question uh, 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 yeah and of course can can you can you help us fixing our approach can we construct the global mode cdpc without random oracles in fact can we construct even a cdpc into a round without random oracles we don't know and uh, well can we find more application like this seems to be a very powerful tool we really stopped with application because we ran out of space, but uh, I'm sure there are more. Um, yeah, and uh, I am happy to take questions. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, so now that you know, does it make sense classically? Or yeah, yeah, in the same way as. as was, it, was it using other work or? or, or? Yeah, now that you has, has, has been known for some time. So, um, um, I think I think classically, well, classically we know all these other. Uh, let me let me just go back to the applications. So, uh, except for yeah, for all the application on the right, classically we know without I/O, so we don't need I/O for that. Um, maybe except for secret sharing for QMA. Um, but uh, we need I/O. To, to, best, to the best of my knowledge, we need IO to construct witness encryption for QMA. Um, and you can you can show that um, and now IO implies witness encryption for QMA also in the classical regime. And I think that's uh, um, um, that's uh, something that people have studied. And I think in the, there is a work that shows that under LWE, witness encryption for QMA implies quantum IO. So th these are very related primitive. So it's something that people studied, studied quite extensively classically. Yes, uh, does it make sense to construct the, uh, this, the verification protocols from RTL uh, without random markets? And did they try to squeeze them using quantum value circuits or something? Um, maybe. I mean, we tried, it didn't work. <laughs> but uh, yeah, in principle, it makes sense. So, the, the, um, so let me go to the CDPC. 
Uh, right, so the CVTC in principle was a multi round protocol. Um, and uh, I think this work from uh, uh, um, CC1 and ACGH20, they, 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 uh, they, they collapsed it to four rounds. Um, and uh, I think, and, and, and two rounds in the, in the quantum random model. Um, so, you know, in principle, we have a four round protocol with, uh, with without random workers, but then you get interactions um, with, with in, in this uh, in these settings. And when you try to obfuscate things, interactions become particularly problematic. And the reason is that <clears throat> normally these protocols are already secure if I'm sending you one message. And then, you, you know, if, you, if I'm trying to send you the message for the same round, you stop answering. But if I'm giving you the obfuscation of the verifier, you can sort of, sort of reset it. Um, I think this is called resettable security. And I think these protocols are not resettably secure. Um, so, yeah, that's maybe one there. Uh, I was thinking this, this mm -hmm. problem you have in the proof yes. where um, you have two circuits, but they're not really functional equivalents. It's just hard yeah. to find inputs that are different. It, it, it reminds you a lot of, 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 of the classical issue of, of, I think it's called DIO, right? yeah, yeah. Um, where there are some results I think that, that indicate it doesn't exist. Um, the fact that you solve the problem, albeit in the random oracle model, does that have any bearing at all on, on the classical DIO? Um... So I think, um, I mean, I forget the exact definition of DIO, but I think it was slightly stronger than what we needed. Um, yeah, so the fact that we solved it in the random oracle is not, not really satisfactory. And uh, in particular, it's if you try to plug in a, a scheme in the, in the random oracle model inside of an obfuscated circuit, it's meaningless. Um, so yeah, you can think of, you can think of the, the, uh, our world to sort of hope to have a scheme in the, uh, in the standard model and hope that this scheme remains secure even if it's in the standard model. Um, there are many work actually that show that, uh, uh, that, that show negative results when you try to obfuscate quantum circuits. So I would say it's not really surprising that we're able to solve this, this with, 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 with random models. Great, good. Anything more? Let's thank Julie again. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you.